I imagine most of you have been able to figure out that Lord Moncton is British. <laughs> in choice of words as well as an accent. We've had a, a number of people asking uh, that we might perhaps have the numerous PhDs, the scientists in this room, gather together for a photograph, which I think would be a splendid idea. And I would like um, all such PhD scientists uh, after this lunch session, if you would please uh, come up here in front of the podium and uh, if you'd like to be part of a picture commemorating this event, we, uh, we really would like to do that and, and be able to distribute that. During breakfast this morning, Dr. Ross McKittrick showed us, in truly expert fashion, that global warming skepticism knows no national borders. We have global warming experts here from many nations, including Russia, England, Australia, Brazil, South Africa, New Zealand, and Canada, to name just a few. Our first luncheon speaker demonstrates demonstrates that Dr. McKittrick is not the only Canadian expert to challenge the notion that humans are creating a global warming crisis. Indeed, this speaker, our first speaker for lunch, is a former climatology professor at the University of Winnipeg and has long been at the forefront of scientists presenting strong evidence that carbon dioxide emissions have a highly overstated role in the global warming debate. And we'll do our best to, uh, to be heard over the clanging of plates being served, but bear with us. An expert on historical weather records, it is his research, published repeatedly in the peer-reviewed literature, that has provided a continuous and reliable data set on Canadian climate where before there was none. While his qualifications are beyond question, the application of his knowledge to the global warming debate has posed numerous difficult questions for those who claim that the moderate warming trend of recent years is human and is human induced and unprecedented. His reconstruction of past climates and examination of the impact of climate change on human history and the human condition have provided weight to a powerful argument against an impending global warming crisis. As a result of this, he has frequently presented his analysis on television, in newspapers, and in leading magazines across Canada and the US. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Timothy Ball. As the uh, second Canadian in a row on the podium, I'd like to tell our American friends that the cold air that we send you from Canada is part of the NAFTA. It was in the fine print. I want to uh, congratulate Heartland on this conference. It's a day I've waited for for 40 years. And... Uh, you. And I must say, I'm, I'm very nervous uh, now that it's arrived. But through those 40 years, and I know uh, others such as Fred, and, and a, a great honor to be on the podium with Fred, uh, at times you start to think you're alone, that you're isolated. And of course, that's been part of the campaign, is to isolate the so-called deniers. And so for me, the gratification in seeing so many other fully qualified people is really, really um, uh, a, a key po a point in my career. I'm, I'm almost tempted to say that this conference is a tipping point. <laughs> but I'm not sure whether that's uh, good at this point. Uh, my life has covered three climate changes. I experienced the pre-war warming. I experienced the post-war. Okay, okay. Okay, is that better? Oh, thank you. There we go. Um, I've ex I experienced the pre-war warming. I experienced the post-war cooling. And then the, the latter part of the 20th century warming. 
And now uh, it appears, and I agree with Michaels that we should be very careful about uh, predictions on it, but it appears we're heading for cooling again. And of course, one of the things that's happened through my career is initially I was called a climate skeptic, and I, that's fine. All scientists should be skeptics, and we've heard that said a couple of times here. But then, about five years ago, the Times of London referred to me as a climate change denier, with all of the Holocaust connotations of that term. And I thought about it for a while, and then I suddenly realized that it is absolutely incongruous, because, in fact, my whole career has been going around telling people the climate changes. I am anything but a climate change denier as are all the people in this room. So it's a very interesting uh, situation to be in. Um, I want to talk to you today about some of the things that, um, the larger context. Um, we saw some presentations where people are saying, step back a little bit. And I remember being at a conference on, on economics and grain prices. And they, were, they said, oh, we want to look at historic data. And they had two years of record. And I'm sitting there with 500 years of climate record. And so unless you step back and put things into context, both factually and philosophically, you really don't understand what's happening. Um, climate um, is a generalist discipline. And by that I mean that when you stand outside and experience the weather, you're experiencing the white noise that is the sum total of everything from cosmic radiation in deep space to geothermal heat off the bottom of the ocean and everything in between. And to try and distinguish the sum, that white noise, which is the sum of all those red noises, is an incredible challenge. And it's become a challenge not only because climate is a generalist discipline, but because it's also occurred in an age of specialization. I know talking to students, and I say, well, what are you going to specialize in? And they say, I'm going to be a doctor. I say, no, that's not a specialization. Red blood cells, that's a specialization. And we've got to the point where we've lost sight of the total body. It, the analogy I like to use is like the doctors looking at the patient, one looking at the feet, the podiatrist, the nephrologist looking at the kidneys, and the, the neurosurgeon looking at the brain. But the nurse is in the corner saying, but doctors, the patient's dead. <laughs> and so we have this problem of individual specialists um, that have developed in a subject of specialization. And we see some of that here with this conference, that there are so many specialists. And you particularly see it with the IPCC, that there are very few actual climate people there, that they are all specialists in one little piece of the puzzle. And I just wanted to put that in a little historic perspective. Alexander von Humboldt is generally considered to be the last universal person. Not a Renaissance man, that is, with a wide range of general knowledge, but a person who knew everything there was to know in the scientific world. He knew chemistry, physics, and everything else. And he died in 1859. And the significance of that is that's the same year that Darwin published his On the Origin of Species. And what we're dealing with today is a result of, a continuum of, those two major events and, and a lot of others as well. And, at, and when Darwin was around, of course, there were just two areas. There were the natural sciences and the humanities. Now we've added the social sciences, which have become some of the largest departments uh, in the university. And a, a whole uh, pattern, we see it here again with the economists, such as Ross, talking. And within each of those sections, um, there's been a proliferation of divisions. Some of the issues during my career it started to realize that they transcended these divisions of, of uh, disciplines. And one of them, for example, was water. I taught a course on water because I realized that drought was the single biggest climate impact on flora and fauna and the human condition. And the students would say, but there's no section in the library on water. I say, no, but it's in every section in the library. There's the chemistry of water, the physics of water, the economics of water. It transcends. That became a problem in the academic world. And so what developed were interdisciplinary studies, attempts to bring groups together that were dealing with a common problem. That really hasn't happened in climate. And so you still have that specialization um, without the common focus. So I'd like to suggest to you that climate is, in fact, a reverse gestaltist um, situation. That is, the sum of the parts are less than the whole. And 
again, we see that with some of the presentations here and what you're hearing. And I like the analogy I like to use is each, each specialist has a piece of the climate puzzle, but we have no box top, or as Essex and McKittrick uh, put it uh, so well, there's, there's no general th uh, theory on climate. We haven't got the Darwinian theory of evolution as a central for a major area of discipline study. And so that's part of, of the challenge uh, to what we're looking at here. And in fact, in climate, we don't even have the corner pieces. If you think when you're going to do a, a jigsaw puzzle, the first thing you do is find the four corner pieces. And then you find the edge pieces. And then you divide the puzzle up into piles of colors to bring some semblance of, of order and, and, and structure to what you're trying to do. And um, so all we've, we haven't even got all the four corner pieces. For example, the oceans, the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and, and those corners of the puzzle, and of course the edge pieces. And we've got some piles uh, of colors, but really very limited and, and essentially isolated. And when you look at one of the questions that I find, and want to shift gears here a bit, because one of the things that Gore's movie did, whether we like it or not, was it was an extremely effective propaganda vehicle. Its use of visual imagery, it was very appropriate that it got a, an Oscar from the land of make-believe. <laughs> and it is that challenge because whether we like it or not, the reality is the media is out there, the public are out there, they're very confused, they want to get, well, what's your, what's your answer? And of course, as scientists, it becomes very difficult. Imagine the challenge in the school where you show Gore's movie with all of its excitement and drama, and then what are you going to put alongside of that? Dull, boring science. It's a huge challenge. And that, that is part of, I think, what, what we're confronted with here. This is a very simple diagram of the complexity of the um, atmospheric system. But one of the things that's happened here is that we've become focused on only one very, very small part of the total complex system. And it, we need to ask ourselves, how did that happen? How did we become so focused to the distraction of other major causes of climate change. And that's a question that when you say to the public, well, look, there's all these other things. And in the backs of their minds, they're saying, yeah, well, the sun, yeah, well, what? sure, that's, that's a big factor, isn't it? Not even talked about. And one of the things that, uh, that you see here is that, of course, the focus, not just on CO2, but on temperature. Now, we've shifted from my career when I started with global cooling, and now we're into global warming, but it's still on temperature. But that's only one small part of the issue. Water, I, you could join me in a campaign I've had going for 30 years to change the name of the planet from Earth to water. Water is the most important element on this planet. It's the one thing distinguishes this from all the other planets. And when NASA go to other places, what's the thing they're looking for? Water. Hardly any focus on that, and especially in climate. And when you look at tree rings, ice cores, glaciers, growth and melt, all the focus is on the temperature, but precipitation is as big a factor. And when you look at the IPCC report, precipitation is virtually ignored because they don't want to confront the water vapor, which is the elephant in the room. And also, of course, the problems with clouds. So the focus on temperature is really troublesome. And, and I can tell you for the farm community, yeah, they know the temperature fluctuates. And they prepared for frost and growing seasons. But what they really want to know is what's the precipitation going to do? And that's important in terms of world food production. What's the precipitation going to do? That's why I think that the focus, oh, there's going to be more droughts, which is counterintuitive because evaporation means more moisture in the atmosphere, therefore less droughts. But they, these people know that the drought is the one thing that, that, that is of great concern for the public. And then a factor that I think has also been overlooked is the wind. If you go back and look at the droughts in the 30s in North America and the strong winds that develop with that as, as an evaporative and heat transport to mechanism and so on. So factors that have been diverted by the focus on CO2 and the focus on only temperature. Part of that has been done by fear and, and people should be really quite um, upset about the fact that Sir John Houghton, the first chairman of the uh, IPCC, said, unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. That's not the way you lead people. You lead people with calm. You don't lead them with fear. 
And yet here he's publicly making that statement. And then uh, Lord Gibbons, who was an advisor to Tony Blair, said, in order to manage risk, you must scare people. And I, this is a, an extremely dangerous tactic um, in terms of leading. But one of the things about exploitation, Michael Crichton wrote his book, States of Fear, um, an exploitation of fear by environmental groups. But I think another thing that's being exploited is the uh, ex lack of knowledge in the public. Their general lack of, of knowledge of science in particular, most of them will admit readily that numbers just scare them to death. They don't, and they're proud of the fact they can't do mathematics. And, and, and the, um, the fact that the, the, the science confuses them, so that exploitation of lack of knowledge. And Mark Twain uh, liked to paraphrase what he said when he said everybody talks about the weather but nobody does anything about it. Um, what he should have said was everybody talks about the weather but few know what they're talking about. And that is, um, is part of the, the difficulty. Part of this problem has been uh, focused on by the confusion created amongst the public and I gave 150 public lectures across the continent last year, so I get a very good empirical feedback. And they're very confused about the switch from global warming to climate change. Now, I, I think this is a good thing because it's raising questions about what's actually happening. And so you get statements like this from a, a Greenpeace climate representative who said global warming can mean colder, it can mean drier, it can mean wetter. That's what we're dealing with. And that kind of inconsistency is raising questions in the public's mind about, well, hang on a minute, can't be all things. And, of course, the cartoonists are the first people to pick up on this. Cartoonists are marvelous uh, in perceiving the incongruities in the society and, of course, can draw it in. And what the caption says at the bottom of this cartoon is, it says, we are anticipating another 8 to 12 inches of global warming today. So, of course, I think that the, the cartoonists and, and the comedians who are so bright and see the world for the inconsistency these have is why so many of them have uh, problems, mental problems. But it, it's, um, it's a very interesting perspective. One of the things that um, I think we need to understand, and I, I hate to bring up the word change in the midst of the election that's going on here in the US. It, it's been so grossly overworked. Um, but the un entire underpinning of Western scientific view of the world is uniformitarianism. This is the concept that change is very gradual over long periods of time. It came from Hutton and Playfair and particularly Charles Lyell, the geologist whose book uh, Darwin took with him. And Darwin, of course, needed enough time for his evolutionary theory to occur. What came out of that was that change is very gradual over long periods of time. But in reality, you only look at a brief climate record and you see that change is dr uh, naturally dramatic and rapid, but not necessarily chaotic. And that debate is, is going on right now. But what this, uh, what this has done is it's allowed people to say that changes that we see are not natural. They're too sudden. They're too dramatic. Therefore, they are not natural, inferring they must be something humans are doing. And what you end up with, of course, is Gore's movie, where what he's doing is he's showing you natural events and telling you they are unnatural. That's the pattern that's developed out of all of this. And of course, the difficulty with that is it means they can never be wrong, because tomorrow there are going to be more natural events. And they'll say, see, we were right. So the concept, so when you talk to the public about change, um, they don't think that change uh, occurs in nature particularly uh, very rapidly, and so that anything that we're seeing suddenly must be something wrong. A good illustration of that, and I remember years ago at conferences when people brought in the Milankovitch effect, the change of the Sun-Earth relationship, uh, they were immediately attacked. And I knew things had changed when in about 1980, late 80s, uh, somebody presented Milankovitch and there was no questions about it. It had received tacit acceptance uh, amongst the community. But at the bottom, it shows you the orbital changes. But you go and look at most of the textbooks in the schools across North America and Europe, as I have, they're still telling the students that the orbit of the Earth around the sun is a fixed, unchanging elliptical orbit. But we've known that scientific information about orbital change caused by the gravitational pull of Jupiter for 150 years. James Kroll was calculating how these orbital changes would affect the climate on the Earth 150 years ago. 
But we're still telling our students that it doesn't change because that dramatic a change from almost circular to extreme ellipse in 22,000 years, is, it doesn't fit the uniformitarian view of the world. Now, I'm going to move through this fairly quickly, but um, we're creatures of symbols. You see it with co corporations will pay millions for a logo. Artists symbolically see the changes that are occurring, just like the cartoonists see what's incongruous in the society. This painting by Turner, if I showed it to somebody from the 19th century, they would see the symbolism of it. The symbolism is that pervaded Turner's work is the new fangled steam engine pulling the old wooden sailing ship to the scrapyard. This is the symbol of the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And when you look at the skies, the art historians will tell you, oh, he was an impressionist painter. You don't get skies like that. In fact, those are the skies that were caused by the, the eruption of the, the uh, volcano Tambura in 1815. And that's another problem. We think because it's not our reality, it didn't happen. But that's assuming that reality doesn't change very much. In our age, the symbolism, this picture became the symbol of the change to environmentalism. We needed environmentalism. Very, very good change. But the problem for the public is, how far do we go with this? Every new ism, feminism, environmentalism, yeah, need necessary changes, but the general public say, well, how far do we go? The role of the extremists is to define the limits for us. And what's happening now is the extremists out there are, in fact, defining the limits for the public. So when I talk to a high school student, I'll say, well, you, you guys care about the environment? Oh, yeah, we care. OK, none of you will ever drive cars. Oh, I don't care that much. Right? You, def you define limits, and, and so out of this environmental movement, we're now reaching the point of the extremists defining the limits for us. When you talk to the public about change, they can't get their minds around even 10,000 years. Here's an image of Canada uh, 22,000 years ago covered with an ice sheet larger than the current Antarctic ice sheet. They can't imagine that. It's beyond their capability of getting their minds around that. And by the way, when the ice ages were first postulated by Louis Agassiz, he dragged the scientists out into the Alps and showed them the evidence of the ice ages because they um, had a hard time getting around. But this kind of thing, the public understand. On the left, you've got um, the uh, weather conspiracy, the global cooling, the coming of the new ice age just in 1970. And by the way, two CIA reports, so it's got to be the truth. And by the way, at that time, the, the CIA coined the word climatocracy, which is a very interesting word applied to what's going on. And then, of course, 20 years later, you've got exactly the opposite. The heat is on, the climate crisis, the cover-up. So we went 180 degrees in just 20 years, which is um, quite remarkable. And then uh, Lowell Ponte's comment in his book, The Cooling, he said, cold fact, the global cooling presents humankind with the most important social political and adaptive challenge we've had to deal with for 10,000 years. Well, if you just change the one word cooling to warming, that is precisely what they're saying about warming today. We've seen a complete flip, a massive amount of confusion, and this is, of course, exploited. And here you see, um, and last uh, winter, by the way, the Antarctic ice was the most uh, on, on record. And then when you get into it, visual Im image, the Holocene optimum, which um, Patrick Michaels talked about. Well, you can look at those, you can look at that graph of Greenland and, and uh, temperatures, and in fact, you could argue that the, in this graph it shows the temperature has gone down for 3,000 years. But all you have to do to show the public the Holocene optimum is this photograph of a white spruce, which is radiocarbon dated at 4,940 4, years old, and it's growing, it was 100 kilometers north of the current tree line. That, then you ask them, as Patrick Michaels did in his presentation, okay, what sort of global temperature do you need to have a tree growing that far north of the current tree line? That does more for the public in terms of understanding um, the science of it than anything else that we can show. And I'll just go through this very quickly. Back in the 70s, Martin Parry, who's now a very strong global warming advocate, was doing studies on the impact of, of the cooling from the medieval warm period. This is the county of Berwickshire up in, in Scotland. And it shows that in, in about 1300, 90% of the county was producing food. By 1600, less than 50% was producing food. The highland clearances in Scotland occurred because they lost 50% of the agricultural land due to the global cooling. 
And uh, so history doesn't make sense unless you understand what was going on. And here's, here's the same county with the farmland and, and commu uh, communities that were abandoned. And in uh, England, you've got 3,000 villages that were deserted, that were occupied during the medieval warm period. And here you can see an aerial pho uh, photograph of a place called Warren Piercy in Yorkshire. One of the things that is forgotten is that when the climate changes, in many areas, the food production increases. Surplus food is surplus time, and you can create any civilization you want. But without that surplus food, it's just a struggle from day to day. And the Gothic cathedrals were built because the climate is warmer, more food, surplus time, surplus people. And here's John Constable's wonderful painting of, of Salisbury Cathedral, uh, which was built in about 45 years. So you imagine the extra food necessary. And of course, the IPCC graph, which suddenly magically disappeared with the hockey stick, showing the trends. And uh, the sort of thing the public understand, if you say on the right side, if that warming is due to humans, what caused the warming when the Vikings were around? Is the crucial scientific question of the day where the Vikings driving Volvos? <laughs> but of course, you shouldn't be too flippant about these things. And just to illustrate, and another part of the concept of change is that, oh, it's going to be too rapid, that nature won't be able to keep up. That's another part of the fallacy and the fear and, and lack of... Uh, this is a, a map drawn by Samuel Hearn. The bottom right-hand corner is Churchill, Hudson Bay. He followed the tree line up to the Coppermine River back in 1772. I transposed his tree line as he drew it. And by the way, he was a biologist. He knew all the Latin names of the species. He knew exactly what he was talking about. And then I drew the current tree line 200 years later. And you can see that in the harshest growing environment in the world, the tree line has moved uh, as much as 300 kilometers, on average 200 kilometers. So here in the harshest growing environment of the world, the trees have adapted by moving one kilometer a year, which is a remarkable adaptation to climate change. And here you see captured in the fur trade records where they recorded the wind on a daily basis. This is Churchill. You see in the, the, the decade from 1721 to 31, none of the winds were uh, above 10% out of the south. But as the world warmed up by 1841-51, every single year was over 10% south winds. They captured in their diaries, without knowing it, a very significant shift of the climate uh, recorded in the wind patterns. Artists painting what was going on, these things resonate with the public. This is Griffier's painting of London, England, 1683. The West, uh, Westminster Abbey on the right, St. Paul's Cathedral, Lambeth Palace. There's a coach and four horses on the ice. But here's a better painting. This is the Thames in 1683 with London Bridge in the background. Three feet of ice, one meter of ice. That resonates with the public, the, the images of that. And Bruegel, we're back to symbolism again. If you could sum up human history in one word, that one word would be hunger. And this painting is a symbol of that. It's called Winter Scene with Bird Trap. And what was the bird trap for? Was to get some pressed pigeon for supper. And so... This sort of image resonates, as I said, uh, with the public. Patrick also showed the um, glaciers. This is Willie Soon's uh, depiction that the glaciers started retreating long before the input of gas and oil and coal and CO2. And of course, um, as Patrick showed you, the Argentier Glacier in, in 1850, and then the current glacier today. And so that's a perfect illustration of that glacier retreat. By the way, one of the things that happened as these glaciers retreated was they exposed Roman lead mines. Roman lead mines that had been dug when it was very warm in the Roman period, but had subsequently be covered by the advancing glaciers. And here's a, a, a photograph I took of a garden in the southwest of England, Trangwayton Gardens, and it shows human adaptation to climate change. The wall on the left side, the high wall, was built during Elizabethan times. As the, cl the climate was cooling, the winds were coming, more storms like the one that destroyed the Spanish Armada. And so what this gentleman did was built big walls that became like a solar collector, and they trained their soft fruits that were so vulnerable to wind and frost damage, like plums and damsons and green gauges, to grow on those walls. But the sloping gardens were built in about 1820. And you can see in, uh, there's a, a, 
a close-up of that little thing that says these, ball, these uh, sloping gardens were built around 1820. Why? Because the angle of incidence of the sun um, had to be increased, so the ground would warm up enough to grow the vegetables for their survival. So the person was rich enough to adapt his garden to the changing climate conditions. Of course, the, the rest of the uh, poor people continued to starve, and that, of course, is uh, what's happening today. Um, I'm going to just show you this very quickly. This shows you the plot of CO2 against temperature over 600 million years. I think the significance of this, because we've got the current level of 385, the significance is that the average CO2 level in the atmosphere over that time is between 1,000 and 1,200 parts per million. And the significance of that is plants seem to function best at that level. Sherwood did so, and his son Craig have shown that. And um, we know that when the levels are reduced to 250 parts per million, the plants start to die. So Gore and these people that want to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere, I wish every plant had a vote on that. Every plant should have a vote on that. And of course, we also know this because commercial greenhouses now are pumping up to 1,000 to 1,200 parts per million to increase yields by a factor of four. No CO2, no plants, no oxygen, no life. And maybe that's what the extreme environmentalists, the anti-humanist environment, environmentalists want. And just get rid of those people. This would be a great place to live. So. Get the last. I think I want to leave you with uh, Tolstoy's possible explanation of what's happening. He said, I know that most men, including those at ease with problems of the greatest complexity, can seldom accept even the simplest and most obvious truth, if it be such as would oblige them to admit the falsity of conclusions, which they've delighted in explaining to colleagues, which they proudly taught to others, and which they've woven thread by thread into the fabric of their lives. He wrote that 100 years ago, and I think it's very applicable today. So I'll, I'll leave you with this last uh, painting by Bruegel, uh, again, uh, symbolism. The symbolism of this painting is the cycle of life, with the adults, men and women, working together to get enough food. Notice there's no children, no seniors. They're off in the fields enjoying the fruits of the labor of, of the middle-aged uh, middle people. In, in the background is a church, not necessarily pushing religion, but the concept of the need for a moral value in a society. And, of course, the whole cycle. Again, if you look at this painting, you say, oh, it can't be right. Bruegel didn't paint it right. Look at the height of the man against the height of the wheat. But the average height of a man at that time was five foot four. And this is European soft wheat, which is average height of five foot six. So, again, doesn't fit our reality, but that doesn't mean to say it wasn't a reality. And you've only got to look at the past to see that climate and climate change um, is very dramatic in short periods of time, and we better learn to live with that. Thank you very kindly. <laughs>